So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Funding and Scaling, our first virtual Funding and Scaling, and you're all very welcome. My name is Connor Carmody. I'm an investment consultant with Dublin BIC, and uh, we're looking forward to a great session over the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Funding and Scaling, Dublin BIC's Funding and Scaling, the purpose of it, I suppose, is to connect entrepreneurs uh, and to provide guidance on the funding journey as you go from from seed to scale up and what we try to do in this series is to explore perspectives from investors from startups that have fun successfully funded and scaled their business uh, and as well talk to support organizations that help people uh, get ready uh, for investment so We've been running this for about four years, uh, and as I say, this is our first virtual event. So hopefully, you'll enjoy it, and you'll get the same sense that we deliver when we when we meet in person. We have a packed agenda this morning or this afternoon. Rather, we have some great speakers, um, investors, entrepreneurs who've who've built businesses. So we hope uh, that you will enjoy it, and it will give you an insight in what does it take to scale a business. Um, a couple of housekeeping points: we do have an exhibition area. You'll see it on the platform. Uh, our sponsors, our supporters, and our colleagues are, are gathered there. And uh, please do stop by uh, and have a look at the exhibition booths. We do have a chat function uh, available, uh, and we're happy to take your questions and comments. I will do my best as I moderate the event to, to pick up your questions as I move through the event. And we also have some time at the end of the event uh, where we will try to address as many of those questions as we possibly can. If you do have any questions and we don't get to answer them, please do reach out to us after the event. We're at startup at dublinbic.ie and we'd be delighted to, to take those questions and, and help you. And I suppose finally, before we get started, if you are thinking about uh, starting a business, you have ambitions to scale, um, do have a look at our website contact us uh, at Dublin BIC. We have an investor ready program, which is at the heart of what we do. And it is designed to help entrepreneurs such as yourself to scale and to grow. And we'd be delighted to talk to you on that. So you're very welcome. Uh, I hope you enjoy the event. And so to get us started, I'm going to ask Michael Culligan, who's the CEO of Dublin BIC to kick us off and say a few words. So good afternoon, Michael, uh, you're very welcome. And I'll hand it over to you and, I'll, and allow you maybe to set the scene for our event. Connor, thanks kindly, and good morning to everybody, afternoon to everybody out there. I'm really um, pleased to formally open the event, and particularly pleased to see that we have over 500 people uh, registered um, for the event. So wherever you are in the greater Dublin area, uh, around the country, or even beyond, uh, you're extremely welcome. And just to reiterate Connor's point there, there is a chat function on the Hopin platform, and having partaken in a few um, events recently, it really helps significantly to animate the session throughout the next hour if people you know, put in some comments as you listen to the entrepreneurs, etc., and questions, of course, as Connor said. May you live in interesting times is a proverb often mistakenly considered to be Chinese, in fact, to be a Chinese curse, ironically. Um, one way or the other, it is certainly the case that we live in very interesting times. Notwithstanding the challenges that we have today, I consider it's a time of major entrepreneurial opportunity. And I'd like to maybe share with you why I think that. The global context is very clear. Even pre-pandemic, we had a whole range of geopolitical challenges from prote protectionism in the United States to, to um, Brexit on our own European door doorway here, increased cybersecurity threats, um, climate change, all of that also is an opportunity, um, as we see in Europe with the new uh, green agenda with focus on policy and funding um, for the green, uh, green direction. And then of course the pandemic came along and torpedoed us economically. Um, in that regard, we see now as we move into the second wave that certain countries, uh, Eastern countries have dealt much, much better, maybe China and um, Singapore, South Korea and places and I guess one of the questions that arises, you know, as we look forward is, will these countries, some of who are a little bit more controlling in their nature, will others follow? And will there be impacts on, on people's freedom and democracies, et cetera, as, as, as we look ahead? These are all questions. Historically, if we look at crisis through history, they've been followed by times of great opportunity. You certainly see that after the Second World War, the golden age of capitalism, I suppose. Um, after the energy crisis in the 70s, there was very large economic growth. And even the most recent financial 
um, crisis 2008 2009 um, you know afterwards spawns the likes of the gig, gig economy um, uber airbnb and many many more um, such companies um, though this time of course each time is different and this time i think we see changes in people's uh, work practices and how society um, uh, exists and uh, works and operates one thing that does not change however is entrepreneurship and innovation are the foundation of all economic growth and in particular as you know i think it's the subset of entrepreneurs the fast scaling ones um, that really are what i would call the economic wealth creators and that's why in times of significant change you have huge opportunity and uh, what i guess what we call creative destruction only it's accelerated so you have necessity of reinvention, which brings new opportunities. Right now, at the moment, we have the transition to the low carbon economy supported by EU policy. We have the digital economy being accelerated by the pandemic. Um, cities are changing, perhaps, in terms of how they um, operate. You have this idea of the 15 minute city where you live, work and play within 15 minutes. And there's an enhanced societal focus, um, a greater focus on work life balance. All of this will bring opportunities for a range of sectors and naturally, of course, technology and software, but transport, logistics, um, healthcare and med tech, um, green products and services, um, marine tech, um, smart energy, perhaps in the future Ireland as a net energy exporter, even the areas like high quality food. So the question arises then, I guess, is where does Ireland fit in all this? But from a macroeconomic perspective, of course, as a small open economy, we are naturally challenged um, by geopolitical uh, or susceptible to geopolitical challenges. Changes in the international tax system will impact us going ahead. Um, however, um, you know, on the really positive side, um, as a I suppose as a location to do to, to do work, we're politically stable, we're politically balanced, have been for a long time. Those less fortunate are looked after in relative terms in Ireland compared to many other countries. It's an easy place to do business. It's a good place to live. There's a good education and a good workforce. Um, if we look at Ireland um, from the microeconomic viewpoint and startups and scale ups, some sectors, of course, have been hugely impacted um, um, uh, by the downturn. There is a lot of um, support and help around such as Enterprise Ireland continues to, to drive its uh, competitive start fund. It has changes, positive ones in the HPSU uh, in terms of the terms for how you, in, how you engage there. The government sustainable um, enterprise fund administered by Enterprise Ireland after some initial teething problems um, has now come to a combination of grant and equity. And um, that's, let's say, been taken up at a very, very significant rate there are a whole range of other supports available through the local deals like online trading vouchers, very important to some companies, microfinance loans of up to 25k, rates waivers, business restart grants, and then there's of course the credit guarantee scheme, all of that's for more established companies. Some sectors of course have benefited, healthcare and digital, uh, digital tech, some of these are even growing throughout the pandemic. How about for startups? Well for startups it's always challenging and it's no less so right now at the moment. Um, you know, anytime somebody is doing a startup, they, uh, you're trying to create something new. So you either have to um, create new value, steal somebody else's lunch or untrap uh, locked, locked, locked value. Um, so I find at the moment, essentially for startups, people just have to work that little bit harder to really truly um, find the problem that they can make a difference to and add significant real value. Um, but it's encouraging to see that notwithstanding the economic climate, that the likes of HBAN, which we manage ourselves, you know, the level of funding that would be raised through it this year uh, would be similar to what was last year, albeit a little bit more to establish businesses. But many, many new businesses are getting money. So good businesses will still get funding from private and public sources combined. Um, but at a very, very early stage, you need grit, you need resilience, you always, need, you always needed that. I just want to take a moment now maybe to comment. My own background is originally technology and then worked internationally for a number of years and came return to Ireland and traveled the world selling embedded software and silicon chips for a number of years before getting involved in innovation and, and startup and scale up companies. 
And I just want to maybe share with you what I have seen over that period in terms of what I would consider the, I suppose, key success factors for entrepreneurship. Um, in particular, I think it's having a leader with clarity of vision for um, you know, what the business is about, absolute clar clarity of vision from the leader. You need a business model that has strong economic rationale to it. It's not just sufficient to have a, prob a solution that fixes a problem. You need to be able to do so in an economic manner, either untrapping locked value or creating new value. And of course, the latter is even more difficult. Market size naturally is important, but market timing is a key factor. Many great businesses, ideas, they didn't quite make it because their timing wasn't right. So market timing is so, so important. Understanding the lifetime requirement in terms of funding, not just your initial funding, what's the lifetime requirement of funding. And then as you scale your company, um, having a balanced management team and adding value to a strong board are ex extremely important. But if I was to call out one core um, success factor, it would be resilience. And you know, that grit, that determination, that resilience, coupled also with passion, which is essential to drive a business that in the early days will have challenges. The real heroes in our economy are the entrepreneurs. Some of you will be familiar with Brendan Naud and his colleague Des Anderson. They established Learn Upon, Learning Management System in 2000, 2012. You may have seen last week they raised 50 million US dollars to expand uh, that business further. They already employ 180 people, another 100 to be added in the next year. In the early days of that business, when there were two of them and they had a global contract and wanted to provide 24 hour service, Brenda would provide it to four in the morning and Des would take over. Tick resilience, big time. Uh, and you might also be familiar with DecaWave. Um, DecaWave was sold in January this year for $350 million. Um, technology for ultra accurate location of devices uh, set up by Michael McLaughlin and Kieran Connell. Those guys funded that business in the early days to 246 angels from Texas and from Ireland mainly. Again, take resilience in that regard. One final example perhaps, um, Pharmapod, a company headed by Leonora O'Brien. Pharmapod has software to help address the issue of medication errors. They're in 10,000 pharmacies globally at this stage and Leonora herself gave a wonderful and very moving talk at Harvard Business School a little while back. She referred in that talk to a young Canadian by um, Andrew Sheldrick was his name, an eight year old by who very unfortunately lost his life through a medication error. And Leonora has become very good friends with um, Andrew's mom and she refers to, you know, that every day they go to work, you know, that's a driver for them in terms of what they do. Um, and a huge believer also, Leonora, I think, in the role of grit and passion, grit for driving, driving your business um, forward. So we need to do all that we can and we need to do more to support and to celebrate entrepreneurs like this, because these are the wealth creators. Um, these are tough times, but are times to be resilient, which is always uh, the underlying entrepreneurial trade required for success. Um, so just to conclude then, as Connor said at the outset there, our role at Dublin Big is to empower entrepreneurs to start and scale internationally traded businesses. Um, so if you or anybody you know is thinking of going that journey, we work in very close partnership with Enterprise Ireland and its HPSU team. And the message is we are here to help. We've had the privilege over 32 years of working with so many companies who go and start with one or two people and build up to 50, 60, 80 or 100 and create economic wealth and allow the next generation to go to college and get educated, which is what economic wealth is all about. So do reach out to us. If you're seeking funding, um, if you're seeking funding, contact us through HBAN or um, our Investor Ready program. As Connor has said, all of that information is available either through our website or in the platform today and the exhibition stage where you can also see information from all our partners who we thank. Finally, my last call out really is just to those entrepreneurs out there who have been severely challenged during the um, downturn, um, we empathize um, with your uh, situation. We ourselves have a major project on the way to double the size of the Guinness Enterprise Center. And that's a challenging model in the short term, but we retain our vision of a global entrepreneurial super hub in the heart of inner city Dublin 8 with 800 people um, and over a five year period, maybe 3000 jobs. And um, so it's important in the tough times to 
um, remember the vision um, for the medium and longer term. I thank you for your time this morning. Wishing you the very, very best. And um, hand back to my colleague, Connor. So thank you, Michael. Um, a really good insight uh, there. Um, I do have a question or two that I'm going to come to, but I suppose just uh, the piece I picked up there was the resilience, the grit and the passion. And certainly while not being being glib about the crisis that we find ourselves in and, and the terrible kind of human cost, there is actually this time of, of opportunity um, that you've outlined. So thank you for that. Can I ask you, Michael, a um, question here? Uh, and I, I suppose it talks to the support for startups. So from your perspective, do you see, you know, a focus on existing or established businesses <clears throat> relative to supports that are available for new startups and maybe your insight on that? Look, it's a very good question. And, you know, if I think anybody who's doing a new startup always will feel that maybe there isn't quite uh, enough support around. To, to answer the question, naturally, there is a f um, support and a focus to some level from all sorts of people, including funders, on existing businesses where perhaps private people or funds, etc., have already invested. And of course, they want to sustain that. But I don't think it's at the exclusion of the startup. Why do I say that? Well, the reality is, and we need to call this out, is the startups are always tough. And when you're at the very start of an early stage startup, you always have to make some progress on your own. You have to do that. You have to show some market engagement, some market traction, it may not be revenue, but you need some proof points. So those things don't change. With regard to the supports are available for those early stages, there are a whole range of supports which have been there over recent times, be it through the local enterprises office, be it through competitive star funds, through AI, be it through new frontiers, and all of those have not gone away. So I don't think that there is less support available for the early stage startup, but perhaps there is a little more focus on the other ones, but not at the expense of the early stage, I think. Thanks, Michael. Last one uh, before I, I, I let you go, but I will ask you to stay with yeah. us for the platform or for the program and I'll come in and out to you. The question I, I think is around agri-tech, but I'd widen it out a little bit and say, is there a very strong, maybe too strong a focus on, on kind of AI and tech as the, the questioner put it to us and maybe to the detriment of things like agri-tech or other sectors? So the question, are we too strongly tech focused and do we need to widen our, our support for other areas? So I think perhaps my initial response is not necessarily that we are too strongly tech focused. It's a logical, it's logical that um, we should have a focus on tech and med tech for that matter. If you look at the um, foreign or the FDI companies that are here in Ireland, from the big software companies to the big pharma companies, then it's logical and we have skill sets and strong skill sets coming out of the colleges in that regard. But I guess the thing then is well, what other areas should we play in? And certainly, you know, agri-tech would seem a logical one from uh, where our background is. And I think perhaps at an economic level nationally, there is a new focus maybe coming a little bit into what you would call apprenticeships and areas like that. And not just um, electricians, carpenters and all that, but broader apprenticeships. And I think that focus, which you would get in countries like Germany and other places, is healthy. And I think if we have a little bit more of that, that might help to um, spur and uh, bring opportunities in agri-tech. I mean, we do have some you know, excellent uh, um, examples in the um, agri-tech, Edmund Harty uh, down in out of Causeway in County Kerry has the most unbelievable business in the agri-tech area, exporting to well north of 100 countries all around the world. So there are more opportunities there and perhaps we haven't quite got there at the speed we, 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 we could do, but I'd be positive that we can do. Thanks, Michael. I'm going to pause it there. I'll ask you to stay with us. Uh, I will come back to you uh, later Thanks on for far. some further commentary.